Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another video. If you're stopping by the channel for the first time, please consider subscribing to my channel. And while you're at it, smash that like button for me. I really would appreciate it. Also, hit that post notification bell so that you're notified every time I upload a new video. Be careful down in the comment section of the videos. A lot of spam, a lot of scammers. I will never ask you to contact me by WhatsApp or Telegram. I also do not invest money for my subscribers, so please be careful. Don't get yourself scammed. Big week, big week. We're gonna be rolling out the new website, the Richard Fain Millionaire Mentor website is rolling out this week, fingers crossed, on Friday. That's the date. Friday of this week, rolling out the Richard Fain Millionaire Mentor website. I'm so excited to bring that website to you guys. It's going to be full of products and services and, 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 and memberships to, 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 to bring us together and, and to give you guys the tools you're going to need to build wealth, whether it be real estate investing, whether it be stock market investing, whether it be building a business, right? Whether it be repairing your credit, all of that's going to be on the new website. So got my fingers crossed that we, we will be launching it uh, this Friday. So I'm going to be working my tail off this week to tweak it, get it ready to go. And, and, and hopefully on Friday, I'll be telling you guys on Friday morning's live stream that it's live. So everybody can go check it out. Give me feedback and hopefully, hopefully utilize that new website to build your wealth. That's the whole point of it, right? The whole purpose of the website is to give you more financial tools to build your wealth. So Fingers crossed, we will have this thing ready to go uh, on Friday. So that's the game plan. So more to come. I'll be kind of dropping some little hints every day this week to prepare you guys. So keep your fingers crossed for me. Keep praying for me that I get this thing buttoned down and, 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 and ready to go uh, by this Friday. Also, if you want to follow me on Instagram, guys, go down to the description box, click on that Instagram link, Richard Fane Millionaire Mentor, and follow me on Instagram. We're going to be doing a lot more stuff over on Instagram, and I'd love to have you guys part of that. So if you don't mind, take a few minutes out, get down to that description box, click on that Instagram link. And follow me on Instagram and then send me a DM to say hello. would love to chop it up with you. But uh, that's one of the things I'm trying to do is get my Instagram built back up. You guys know last year I had a huge Instagram following. Almost 90,000 of you guys were following me and we were interacting. And Instagram shut the page down, right? They shut it down because of there was a lot of activity around my page from scammers and stuff like that. So they shut the page down. Without me, I, I didn't have a vote. They didn't give me a vote. <laughs> they just shut it down. So I had to create a new one. So I went from Richard Fane 28 to Richard Fane Millionaire Mentor. So go follow me. Give me a follow and come rock with your boy over on Instagram if you don't mind. Like I said, link down in the description box. If you want seven free stocks, Moomoo is going to give you seven free stocks. When you make $100 into your new brokerage account, they're gonna give you seven free stocks. Now that link for that offer is down in the description box. Click on that Moomoo link. Now, they're not gonna give you any regular smeggler seven free stocks. No, 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 no. They're gonna give you the Magnificent Seven. Apple, Meta, Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, NVIDIA, and Tesla. They're going to give you the Magnificent Seven. Fractional shares. They're going to give you fractional shares of the Magnificent Seven when you open your Moomoo brokerage account, put $100 in there. 
they're going to give you the Magnificent Seven. Guys, this is a limited time offer. There's nobody else out there in the marketplace giving you the Magnificent Seven when you sign up for their brokerage app. Nobody. Nobody's giving you the Magnificent Seven fractional shares other than Moomoo. So if you want to take advantage and have the Magnificent Seven in your portfolio, along with your ETFs and your other individual stocks, click on that link. Open up your Moomoo account today. Go get that free stock. Go get that free money. It's the Magnificent Seven. How do you pass that up? You guys do know what the Magnificent Seven is. They're all heavyweights. They're all big boys. Don't miss this opportunity. Plus, yours truly, that's my brokerage app that I use primarily for 2024 and beyond to double my net worth through my wealth transfer blueprint. Many of you have asked for that wealth transfer blueprint. I've sent it to you via email. It's a video that I did outlining the three big boy blue chip paper assets I'm buying in 24 and beyond to build wealth. You're more than welcome to copy my plan or create your own plan. I'm not your financial advisor. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not a CPA. I'm not a CFP. I'm just a guy who made a decision, who disciplined himself, who developed some consistency, who developed some patience. And I just paid myself first every month and invested in assets and built wealth over 25 years by myself. Wasn't no YouTube when I first started, guys. Wasn't no internet. It was just a guy that made a decision that, hey, when I get to a certain age in my life, I want to be a millionaire. I want to have freedom. I want to have choices. I want to have time. You got to make that decision. Get down to that description box, click on that Moomoo -moo link, and get started. Magnificent Seven fractional shares and then guess what put a hundred dollars in there and keep buying the magnificent seven through fractional shares because moomoo -moo offers that right now they offer fractional shares but you got to have money in your account right you got to put money in there and you can buy fractional shares of the magnificent seven and build your wealth oh nvidia's nine hundred dollars a share i can't afford that well guess what if you got five dollars you can buy a fractional share of nvidia if you got $25, you can buy a fractional share of NVIDIA. Now you are a owner of NVIDIA. You're a small owner in NVIDIA. You're a shareholder. I keep telling you guys, stop being, st listen, stop being stakeholders and become shareholders. Shareholders are owners. They participate in the profit. They participate in the growth. They participate in the ownership. Get down in the description box, click on that Moomoo link, open that Moomoo account today, become a shareholder, get the Magnificent Seven, get fractional share trading. There you go, man. It's up to you. It's your, it's your financial freedom. I'm just trying to give you some tools. There's a tool down in the description box. It's a Moomoo link. That's a tool. Take advantage of that financial tool, guys. We got a lot to cover, so let's, 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 not, let's not delay it. We, we got, the, we got, the, we got the, the elephant in the room. There's starting to resurface a lot of talk, guys, about recession. You guys think I'd be joking with these titles. I don't be joking. I'd be, I'd be serious. There's, a t there's talk. It's starting to build up some momentum. This recession talk again. So we're going to talk about that. What are the risks? that we face when it comes to recession. There's some risks. So we'll talk about that. We're gonna also talk about the Fed and how the marketplace is starting to lose some confidence in what the Fed has been saying as it relates to interest rate cuts. They're starting to lose a little bit of faith. We're gonna talk about that too because that impacts us. Those are the two top priorities today. We got we got to talk about this recession thing that started to, to gain some some momentum, and then we got to talk about what people are saying about the Fed, what these experts are saying about the Fed, and and, and how the Fed is handling this 
interest rate thing. We're going to talk about that. We're going to also talk about mortgage rates because I've gotten several of you who've DM me and emailed me and said, hey, Richard, can you cover mortgage rates? Can you can you kind of give us an idea of when we can expect mortgage rates to come down? So we're going to talk about that, too. We're going to talk about that, too. Then we're going to talk about what we can expect this week in the market. Some 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 heavy hitters coming out this week, guys, and you, you better be paying attention. You got a CPI inflation report that's coming out. I want to say Wednesday. I believe it's Wednesday the, the 10th. That's a CPI inflation report for March. That's huge. That is a real key indicator that tells us what the Fed is going to do later on in the year. In May meeting, in their June meeting, this CPI report is huge. So I'm telling you, be paying attention on Wednesday. If, if, if not... Bring yourself back here on Wednesday morning at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time, and I'm going to run you through the numbers. Y'all know I'm going to be on here running you through the numbers anyway. So if you can't, if you miss it, just show up to the live stream at 10.30 on Wednesday morning Eastern time, and you know I'm going to give it to you. The good, the bad, the ugly. But that's a key piece of data that's coming out this week. Another key piece of data that's coming out this week is the PPI inflation report, Right. Both of those are coming out, one for businesses, one for consumers. So we're going to talk a little bit about what else is going to be happening this week as well. And then you guys know, which is the custom on this channel, that I give you your daily dose of crypto. So at the end, we'll give you a daily dose of crypto. Because I know many of you, <laughs> I know many of you only tune in for the crypto conversation. <laughs> I know many of you love the crypto conversation, so we're going to save that to the end because many of you love that part of the discussion. So I'll give you a daily dose of crypto, but let's dive into right off the bat. No delay. Let's jump into. We're not going to jump into the recession talk just yet. We're going to save that for a minute. Let's set the stage. So let's let's tap into what these economists or these, these experts uh, are starting to feel about the Fed. Okay, here's the headline. They can't get it wrong again. That's what they're saying to the Fed. Y'all can't get this thing wrong, guys. Because if you do, guess what? We're going to be in a recession. Don't get it wrong. So this is what they're saying. This is the headline. They can't get it wrong again. Economists are increasingly uncertain about the Fed. Fed rate cuts this year. Now people are starting to question them. Because see, beginning of the year, end of last year, they were gung-ho. Even March Fed meeting of this year, they still said three cuts were on the table. Let's see. Let's see what the, what the market is saying. The U.S. Federal Reserve is determined not we already starting off bad, right? We already starting off with a negative. When you hear that not, that's already starting. I'm already thinking crazy already because I'm already just, I ain't even one sentence into this thing and it's already not starting out good. But let's, let's, let's proceed. The U.S. Federal Reserve is determined not to reduce interest rates too soon. And some economists say recent data has pushed a summer cut completely off the table. Now these people talking about we ain't even going to get a rate cut in June or July. <laughs> Come on, guys. What are we doing here? Oh, okay. Let's keep going. Friday's job report, which we covered in detail. We, we covered the March jobs report. Great for the economy. Not good for interest rate cuts, right? Great for the economy, not good for interest rate cuts. The Friday's job report reiterated the seemingly unwavering strength of the U.S. labor market and suggested further need for the Fed caution. All eyes will now be on Wednesday's consumer price index. After February's 
annual inflation rate of 3.2 came in slightly higher than expected. I just gave y'all a mouthful right there. I gave you a mouthful right there, guys. Jobs report comes out, right? Last week, jobs report came out. We covered that. Labor market, red hot. The Fed has been saying all along, we got to cool down the labor market before we can beat inflation. The Fed has been saying that all along. We got to cool down the labor market. We got to cool it off. It can't be this red hot in order for us to beat inflation. That didn't happen in the March jobs report. It came in red hot. What does that mean? That means the Fed can't reduce interest rates. You can't have a booming economy with a booming labor market and then you introduce cheap money to that booming economy and that booming labor market. You can't do it. You cannot introduce cheap money to that economy when it's already overheated. It will overheat it even more and then inflation will go back up. That's why the Fed is saying no dice, no dice. We cannot cut rates with a booming economy and a robust, booming labor market. You cannot introduce another money supply to this economy or we're going to do what? We're going to drive back up inflation. That's basically what the data from the jobs report has told the Fed. And that's why the Fed is cautious and they're going to remain cautious. But how long they remain cautious could throw us in a recession. Could. But let's read on. Let's read on. Wednesday's Consumer Price Index. That's the CPI inflation report for March. Very important piece of data. Remember, jobs report and these CPI reports are very, very, very important pieces of data when we're thinking about interest rates, right? That is coming out next. No, it'll be out Wednesday. Wednesday, two days from now, it'll be out. And we'll see. Last month's report wasn't very good when it comes to convincing the Fed to reduce interest rates. Matter of fact, inflation ticked up a little bit. It ticked up a little bit, right? 3.2% came in slightly higher than expected. What does the Fed want inflation to be? 2%. Last month, it came in at 3.2%. So it's still over. My argument all along has been 3% is the new normal. I don't think we get down to 2% anymore. 3% is the new normal, but I could be wrong. I'm just a guy on YouTube, right? How do I know anything? I don't know. I'm just a guy on YouTube. It comes as a growing number of market participants have raised the possibility of no rate cuts at all this year. No rate cuts. What do you think that does to the stock market? What do you think that does to crypto if that gets out, that the Fed is not going to reduce rates this year? What do you think that's going to do? Because you already know Something, something really, really strange is happening with interest rates in assets. Because we already know the relationship between interest rates and assets are, they go in a different direction. So when interest rates are up, assets typically come down. Why do assets come down when interest rates are up? Here's why. See, when, 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 Borrowing money becomes too expensive. That means people like you and I and others can't go borrow that money and invest it in assets. So when interest rates go up, money becomes too expensive. That takes one of the supply chains of money out of our economy. Now people can't borrow money to buy assets. What does that do? It decreases demand for assets. When money is too expensive to borrow, that's one supply system of money that's taken out of the economy. When you take that supply system of money out of the economy, demand goes down for what? Demand goes down for assets. People borrow money to buy assets, guys. People borrow money to buy real estate. People borrow money to start businesses. People borrow money to invest in the stock market. 
But when you can't borrow money cheaply, you can't buy assets. Therefore, the demand for assets go down. When the demand for assets go down, guess what? Asset values go down. That's why when interest rates are high, assets go down. What happens when interest rates are low? Guess what happens to assets? They go up in value. Why, Richard? Because now you're introducing another supply of money to the marketplace, to the economy. See, when rates are down, people can go borrow money cheap at a reasonable rate. 3%, 2%, 4%. They can then take that 2% money, that 3% money, that 4% money. They can go buy assets and those assets get them 5, 6, 7% money. They borrow it for two, three, four percent, but they can go get five, six, seven percent from the asset. So it makes sense. Okay, I'm a guy, I'm gonna go buy me a piece of real estate, get me a three percent loan, 30 year fixed. I'm gonna take that piece of real estate, put me a tenant in it, I'm gonna collect my rent, I'm gonna get a cash on cash return of 10 percent. I borrowed the money for three percent, I'm getting a cash on cash return for 10 percent, net net, I'm winning. 7% to the positive. So when money is cheap to borrow, guys like me, gals like me, go borrow money. We take that money. We buy assets. What does that do to assets? It increases demand. Assets go up. So when interest rates are high and assets are high, why? I'm going to tell you why. Because of optimism. That's why. And guess what's getting ready to happen to that optimism? It's going to go down because if the Fed comes out on record and say they're not going to cut these rates this year, that optimism goes away. As soon as that optimism goes away, assets go down. Why? Because rates ain't going down. Rates are up. Rates and assets shouldn't be up at the same time. The only thing keeping rates and assets up at the same time is investor enthusiasm. They're thinking rates cuts are coming. Let's start getting in. But if they don't come, boom, they take their money out. That's, that's the relationship between assets and interest rates, guys. I just gave you a little one-on-one there. Hopefully you paid attention to it. That's the deal. That's the way it works. The only reason we got this anomaly today is because of investor enthusiasm. See, FOMO, it's called FOMO, fear of missing out. Nobody wants to miss out. Everybody's chomping at the bits for interest rates to come down. Get in, let me get in now and get in the video right now at 8.85 a share. When they bring rates down, it goes up to 1,085 a share and I make $200 per share. Let's get in now. That's FOMO. But that FOMO going to wear off if people find out the, the Fed ain't reducing the rates. <laughs> that FOMO going to be gone. Where's FOMO? It left. It's gone. It disappeared. It's back up in the clouds. That's what's going to happen. I'm trying to tell you. So pay attention. Here we go. Here we go. Important thing you need to pay attention to. Because y'all think I'm just coming up with this stuff on my own. Let me, let me show you who else coming up with it. It comes as a growing number of market participants have raised the possibility of no rate cuts this year, including Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari, who said last week that no reductions were a possible scenario if inflation continued to move sideways. Yeah, this is the Federal Reserve president. This is a Fed president saying this, guys. This ain't Richard Fain. Oh, that was Richard Fain. What does he know? He, he don't know nothing. He, he, he don't know anything. He, he's not a CFP. He's not a financial advisor. He's not a CPA. This guy don't know anything. Oh, you ain't got to listen to me. You can listen to the Fed president, one of the Fed presidents. He just told you. If inflation moves sideways, he votes to not reduce rates. And he ain't the only one, guys. I done, I done, over the last couple of weeks, I done, I done quoted four or five of these people. 
Fed governors, Fed presidents, all saying the same thing. So why is that CPI inflation report that's coming out Wednesday so important? That's why. That's why. See, last month, guess what inflation did? It moved sideways, just like this guy just said. What did it do in January? It moved sideways. What is it going to do in March? We'll know on Wednesday. Now, if it drastically is going down, that's a good one for interest rates coming down. If, it, if we can see it moving down, that's good news for, 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 for a possibility of interest rates coming down. But if it moves sideways or slightly up, yeah, we may not get a rate cut this summer. We may not. We may not. Chief economist told CNBC on Monday that rate cuts in the summer were now looking much less likely. See how the economists are starting to change. They're starting to change, right? Uh, uh, you know, l last month or earlier, yeah, in March. In March, you had like 70% of these folks thinking it was a rate cut coming in the summer. 70% of them. That number's going down. That number's going down. Personally, I wouldn't be surprised if, if we saw less rate cuts and pushed more towards the end of the year. So he's thinking, maybe not completely off the table, but pushed towards the end of the year, maybe fourth quarter. Make a sweat for nine quarters, and then boom, in the fourth quarter might come in. Sort of like last year. Remember last year when, when, when the market went on that nine-week run at the end of the year? It just went bananas. Maybe that's what we have this year. I don't know. What should you be doing as an investor? Positioning yourself, buying assets. I keep telling y'all guys, you better be buying assets right now. Stop trying to time the market. Get yourself in the market. Oh, I'm going to wait around. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait and see what they're going to do with interest rates. It's going to be too late. The big money going to be gone. The big money is buying now when you can buy them at a discount. That's the big money. Well, what if they don't reduce and I spend all my money on, on assets right now and they don't reduce the rates and they fall even further? What do I do? Buy more. That's what you do. You build wealth in the red, not in the green. You build wealth in the red. I wish they would not reduce them and they fall by 20%. I got my fingers crossed that's what happens. See, a lot of y'all don't think like me. See, I want them. I, listen, guys. I don't care if they reduce rates. If they reduce them, I build wealth anyways. If they don't reduce them, I build wealth anyways. Either way, I build wealth. See, this is what a lot of us miss about assets, especially the right assets. If they reduce rates, I build wealth anyways. If they keep rates higher for longer, I build wealth anyways. Well, Richard, what do you mean? Explain that to me. How in the world can you do both? Well, here's, here's how I do both. If they reduce rates, guess what? I'm in the market right now. I'm in the market right now, guys. See, I've been in the market every day, 365 days a year. See, a lot of y'all want to sit on the sideline and be like, oh, I'm going to wait. I ain't in the market. So you don't have this option like I do because I stay in the market every day. See, time in the market is better than trying to time the market. So through dollar cost average, I stay in the market. So I'm already buying assets cheap. What do you mean cheap? They're not cheap. They're at all-time highs. When they reduce them interest rates, do you think we're going to set new all-time highs? Or does it go down? Or do rate? We're going to set new all-time highs if they reduce rates, guys. So even today, while I'm buying at all-time highs, I'm still buying cheaper than they're going to be when the rates come down. They're going higher. We're going to set new all-time highs. They're already predicting. If rates come down, guys, they're already predicting the S&P north of 5,500 points. So guess what I'm buying at today? I'm buying at 51. I'm buying at 52. And I buy all year long at 51, 52. And then the tail end of 24, they reduce rates and the thing go to 5,500 points. I win. I win. Now, let's look at the reverse side. Let's say I'm buying all along right now. And then all of a sudden they don't reduce rates and the S&P falls back down to 4,800 points. Guess what I do then? I just buy the dip. I buy the dip. 
So I, I'm buying at 51, I'm buying at 52, boom, it fall down to 48. I buy at 48, I buy at 48, I buy at 48. And at some point, guess what the S&P going to do? It's going to get back up to that 51 again, 52. And then it's going to jump up to 55. All of that time it was at 48, I'm buying at a discount. And I'm just hanging in there and holding on, holding on, holding on. See, guys, it doesn't matter. Bad times, good times, I'm building wealth because I know how assets work. I know how the market works. I know how these cycles work. Every time it dips, what happens? It comes right back at some point, long as I stay in there long enough. S&P 500 was, S&P 500 index was 2,000 points in 2014. 2024 it hit all-time highs at 5,200 points and change. How do you do 3,200 points in 10 years? That's what I'm trying to tell you guys. It's going to go back. That's what it does. So you can build well both ways, but you got to be in the market. The point of the conversation is you got to get yourself in the market. You got to be in the market every day. You got to have money in the market every day and then be able to hold it for 10 years. Some of y'all want to put money in today and think you're ready to take it out tomorrow. No, that's not how you build wealth. That's how you frustrate yourself and quit. Learn the psychology of the stock market. Learn the psychology of money. That's what we try to teach here on this channel is the psychology of money, the psychology of how to make money. Part of that psychology is what? Discipline. Consistency. Patience is part of the psychology of money, part of the psychology of making money. Got to have those three things. If you're going to win at this thing. Let's keep moving. This is a strong economy. Make no mistake. It is backed by debt and somewhat by overburdened credit cards. <laughs> he ain't lying, guys. Credit cards up to $1.3 highest in American history. The highest credit card debt in the world. We have it right here in the U.S. This guy ain't lying. This is a strong economy. Make no mistake. It is backed by debt and somewhat by overburdened credit cards. But it is a strong economy, so the Fed will struggle to find the case to cut rates soon. There you go. He hit the nail right on the head. We are a country of debtors. We are a country of debtors. Oh, Richard, why do you drink your coffee? Why are you slurping when you drink your coffee? That's what somebody emailed me. <laughs> they didn't email me. They think they put it down in the description box. Not description box, but in the comment section. Well, what are you going to drink your coffee while you're talking? What are you going to take three seconds out and drink a sip of coffee? And then when you take the sip... What do you got to slurp? Can you not drink your coffee without slurping? What? I don't, what? How do you drink coffee without slurping? Okay, I'm sorry. Let me get back to the task at hand. I'm sorry. I, I had not. Okay, I'm done. Let me, let, me, let me get back on this thing. Okay, market pricing reflects the ongoing uncertainty with the probability of a rate cut now at 50%. What I just told y'all five minutes ago. Y'all think I just be out here just, y'all think I just wake up in the morning. Some of y'all think I just wake up in the morning and I just get on here and just be, just be babbling stuff. I know some of y'all think that, but guys, don't get me wrong. Now. I ain't, I'm not, I'm not some, some, some think tank over here. I'm not a think tank. I'm not that serious. I ain't, I'm not a ooh, all night write notes and graphs and chart. No, nope, I'm not a think tank, but I do prepare guys. I do know what I'm talking about. I'm an expert at my own opinion. <laughs> I'm an expert at my own opinion, guys. I am an expert at my own opinion. So let's not get it twisted. I could give myself a PhD in this stuff. If you, no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Let me keep going here. The market pricing reflects the ongoing uncertainty with the probability of a rate cut now under 50. So five minutes ago, I told y'all in March it was up to 70% that they would cut rates this summer. That, that's where the market was. It was 70%. Now they're saying we're all the way down to 50%, half and half. 50% they will, 50% they won't. And it's dropping. 
That's not good news. Both June and July, according to CME's FedWatch tool, significantly lower than at the start of the month. Wow. The Fed has been pushing itself ever since 2021. When team transitionary got it wrong, right? What they feel is that they can't get it wrong again. So they're saying in 2021, they got it wrong a little bit. It took them too long to start increasing rates. That's what they're saying. So they're saying the Fed, when the Fed start increasing rates, guys, in June, no, I'm sorry, in March of 2022, a lot of people thought that was too late. They should have did it in 21. That's what the guy's saying. He's saying they got it wrong. They should have started jacking rates in 21, but they waited to the end of the first quarter, almost first quarter 22. So he's saying they got it wrong. Now they're saying they can't get it wrong again. They cannot afford to get it wrong again, right? What? You waited too long to jack rates. You can't wait too long to lower rates. You can't miss both. You miss jacking rates. You waited too long to start jacking and things got out of control in the economy and inflation got to 9% because you waited too long. They're saying now, if you wait too long to reduce, you throw us in a recession. Just telling you, that's what these guys are saying. I, I, I'm just reporting, right? That's what they're saying. Despite this, he said it remains very likely that there will be rate cuts this year. They do have some room to cut, but they don't want to get it wrong. They do not want to be the Fed that cut rates as inflation kept beating expectations. And that's true. Jay Powell don't want to be remembered for this, guys. Let me tell you that right now. This guy is a one percenter. I don't know what his net worth is, but it's up there. He's a one percenter. And all his legacy, guys. See, this is how these rich people think. It's how these wealthy people think, especially if they're in these type of positions, right? These power positions. They don't really care about the money. What they care about is their legacy. What they care about is how people are gonna talk about them when they leave the job or when they're dead. That's what they think about. So Jay Powell, the Fed chair, he don't want people thinking about him like, oh yeah, he waited too, he, he waited too late to jack, he waited too late to reduce. That's his legacy. He don't want that to be his legacy. So yes, they're gonna do everything they can to get this thing right. Because these rich folks, that's, their legacy is what they live, especially these big, these power players, they, they live for legacy. They're already rich. They ain't you and me right here struggling in credit card debt, they ain't on car loan debt, student loan. Eh, they don't worry about that kind of stuff. They, they don't clean their own house. We clean our own house. They don't go to the cleaners and get their clothes. We go to the cleaners and get our clothes. They don't cook their own food. They got people that cook their food. They don't pay their own bills. They don't worry about no light bill. They ain't worry about no uh, gas bill. They ain't worry about none of that. They ain't worry about none of that. All they worry about is legacy. So he ain't gonna reduce them rates unless he believe they right because his legacy is at stake here. I'm just telling you, that's how these people think. They, they're on a different wavelength than you and I. You and I, we worried about how we gonna put food on the table, how we gonna keep the lights on, how we gonna keep gas in that car. How are we going to put clothes on our kids' back? You know, that's the stuff we think about. These people don't think about that kind of stuff. Mm -mm. They don't think about none of that. One percenters, 99 percenters. But what is the goal, though? The goal is to get ourselves in a financial position where we don't have to worry about that either. Right? That's the goal. The goal is to invest, build wealth, so we don't have to worry about the light bill. How are we going to put gas in the car? Where are we going to get the food for tonight? How am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to send my kids to college? I got no college fund for them. Right? How am I going to take care of myself in old age? See, unless you build wealth. See, y'all think I'd be doing all this, guys, because I'm trying to be some little reporter. No, no, that's not why I do this. I do this because I know there are millions and millions and millions of you guys out there who are trying to get some direction in this whole game of wealth building and getting to your freedom. And I know a lot of times people get on here and they got a lot of jargon, they got a lot of big old words and nobody don't understand them. 
See, I try to get on here and give it to you just in a normal person's language and kind of explain it to you while I'm reading it. I just kind of explain it to you in a, in a regular person so you can understand what's going on. Just like I did with the interest rates up, assets up. We just broke that thing down so everybody could understand the relationship between interest rates and assets. That's the reason I do this. This is just to give you some facts or give you some good information, but then I break that information down for you in a, in a normal person's language so you can understand it. So hopefully you appreciate that, but let's move. Speculation that there could be no interest rate reduction this year has been growing, although economists remain divided. So people out there in the marketplace are divided. There's that 50-50. Remember we just talked about the 50-50 that they're gonna reduce in June or July? That's where people are divided. 50% says no rate cuts, 50% says rate cuts. What determines either one? This data that's coming in, that, that, that CPI inflation report for March, that jobs report for March, CPI inflation report for April, jobs report for April. Those are the types of things that the Fed will be looking at to see if it's safe to reduce rates and not get caught with their pants down, right? That's the thing. So it's 50-50 right now. Whereas former Federal Reserve Vice Chairman Roger Ferguson told CNBC last week he sees a 10% to 15% chance of no rate cuts this year. Now, this guy is a former Federal Reserve vice chair. So he wasn't a big dog like Jay Powell, but he was the dog right underneath Jay Powell. He was the second dog. He wasn't a big dog. He was the second dog, right? He, ain't, he got a really, really dim outlook on this thing. So we don't know if he's right. We don't know if he's wrong. The, the key here is we prepare. See, we prepare for the worst but expect the best. What do you mean by that, Richard? What do you mean prepare for the worst and expect the best? Well, prepare for the worst. Let's say there don't be no rate cuts. What's your game plan? How you, what's your game plan to build wealth if there are no rate cuts? And what is your game plan to build wealth if there are rate cuts? I'm gonna make it simple for you. Here's what I recommend your game plan be. Get yourself in the market. Get yourself in the market either way, it doesn't matter. You still win if you do it long enough. Doesn't matter. See, that's the little pro tip. That's the little secret, right? The secret to this whole thing, guys, is it don't matter what the market does. As long as you're in there consistently and you do it long enough, you win. The market has demonstrated that time and time and time again. I've been doing this for almost three decades. I've been doing this since I was 26 years old, guys. 26, I'm 56. I've been doing this 30 years. See, I'm not some 15 year old TikToker who telling you, oh, here's the hottest new thing. Go follow me, go do this, go buy that crypto. Go there, he's 15. I'm 56 years old, been in this thing for 30 years. And guess what I've always done? Just stayed in the market. Just stayed in the market. 2008 downturn, stayed in the market. Bought up more. And guess what? Ultimately, those assets went up in value as the market corrected itself, as the market adjusted itself. Those assets that I bought in that deep discount period of 2008, I won because I understood the fundamental thing about investing. Buy low, sell high. And be in the market 365 days a year. If you do that, you win. If you just be in the market 365 days a year, buy low, sell high, you're good. What does that mean? Do I buy low today and sell high tomorrow? Well, if you've reached your financial goals, I guess that means you get out. But one thing I would look at is if I put money in the market and it goes up a little bit and I look at it and I say, well, can that take care of me? Uh, no, it can't take care of you. Then I stay in. That's all you got to ask yourself. Because people ask me that all the time. <laughs> When do I get out? Well, if financial freedom is what you're chasing, and what's financial freedom? Assets that generate passive income to take care of me. That's financial freedom. So if I'm in the market and I look at my assets and I say to my assets, 
Can you take care of me assets? Can you generate enough passive income to replace my income that I currently am making now on my job? If my assets say, no, Richard, we're not ready to do that yet. Then guess what you should do? Okay, assets, I'll buy more of you. I'm gonna keep buying more of you. I'm gonna keep buying more of you. Five years from now, you go back to your assets, you ask your assets the same thing. Hey, assets, I know five years ago you said to keep buying. You wasn't ready to make enough income to take care of me. Are you ready today? Can you take care of me if I quit this job? Richard, no, not quite. We're better than we were five years ago, but keep going. Okay, assets, I'll keep buying more of you. That's how you do it. At some point, you're going to go to your assets and ask your assets, and your assets are going to say, yes. Yeah, we can generate 5000 a month for you. We can generate 7000 a month for you. We can generate 8000 a month, 10000 a month, 12000 a month for you. Go ahead and leave that job. You're good. We got you. We got your back. That's when you get out. But when you look at the assets and you talk to the assets and they say, uh-uh, we ain't ready. What you getting out for? You, you keep buying. You keep, you keep buying. You don't get out. You keep buying. That's the thing we got to understand, guys, about buying these assets. The goal is we want to build these assets high enough where they generate enough income to take care of us. Good times and bad times, we build wealth. And how do we do that? We're in the market 365 days a year. That's how we do it. Trust the process. Oh, I don't know anything about the stock market. Great. You're an excellent candidate to build wealth. If you know nothing about the stock market, you are an excellent candidate to build wealth. Only thing you got to really learn how to do is follow directions. You ain't got to be an expert. You just got to follow directions. But see, a lot of people don't want to follow directions. They want to come up with their own directions, but they don't know nothing. See, when you don't know nothing, your directions ain't going to get you nowhere. The focus should be, let me find somebody that knows a little something and I can follow some directions from them. I don't need to be the expert. I just need to be in the market 365 days a year. I need to buy great blue chip big boy assets and just do that for the next 10 years. And I'm Gucci. That's, that, that's, that's my opinion. You may differ. You may differ. Based on the current growth and inflation forecast, Goldman Sachs chief economist told CNBC on Friday he would expect some rate cuts based on what Chair Powell and other Fed officials have said. The timing of that, of course, is going to depend on near-term data, a.k.a. CPI inflation report coming out Wednesday. That's what he means by near-term data. On the reaction function from the Fed, but under our forecast, I would be quite surprised if we didn't get rate cuts this year. Quite surprised. So there you go, guys. That's your little update on what the market is thinking about the Fed and what the Fed is getting ready to do. That's your little update. Now, we're going to dive into this recession thing because there's another, there's another strong case to be made for recession risk, right? There's a strong case for that. So let's dive into that. Here's the headline. The U.S. economy still faces a recession risk. The U.S. economy still faces a recession risk. The U.S. economy has avoided a recession so far, but the risk of a deeper economic downturn still looms, according to financial analyst Gary Schilling. Take U.S. small businesses as one of the normal pieces of a recession, right? Such as the yield curve. The leading indicators, Schilling said. Now, he's getting into a little bit of the weeds and jargon and all that, so we ain't going to worry about all that. We're going to get to the nitty-gritty. Small businesses are very sensitive to economic conditions because they don't tend to be very heavily capitalized. Now, 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 now let's, let's fast forward. Oh, oh, let's rewind back to the conversations that I've had with you guys. See, that's why it's important, I think, for you guys to either be in the, the live streams or at least go back and look at the videos when they turn into video format. Because I've been telling y'all for weeks, for weeks, the people who are hurting right now in these two economies that we live in, we got this economy up here for the 1%, that's amazing, booming. Then we got this economy down here 
which is the bust economy, or, or, or what former President Trump likes to call the cesspool economy. See, we got two economies. This economy down here is full of people like you and me and small businesses. See, small businesses make up 95% of the businesses in the United States. And exactly what this guy just told y'all, I've been telling y'all, small businesses need to borrow money to grow. When they cannot borrow money, they cannot grow. When they do not grow, they do not do what? Increase revenue. When they can't increase revenue, guess what happens? Their expenses at some point could exceed revenue. And at that point, they have negative net profit and they got to either lay people off or they got to shut the doors. They borrow money to support growth. When interest rates are too high, they cannot borrow money. That's a critical part of how they fund growth is through borrowing money. That's exactly what this guy just told y'all. Exactly what he just told you. Small businesses are very sensitive to economic conditions because they don't tend to be very well capitalized. All he's saying there is most small businesses don't have no money. Their owners ain't got no money and the business ain't got no money. Now, they could get some money if they can continue to scale and continue to create products and services that people want to buy and they can create demand and then they can come through on that demand with, with supply, borrowing money. They can make a living and grow. But he's saying most of them are undercapitalized. That means when you and I start a business, we really don't have enough money to start that business to grow it the way it needs to grow if we really want to hit a home run. Nine out of 10 times, you and I are going to have to go out and get a loan from somewhere at some point to help us buy that building or to help us with that R&D research cost or to help us do some type of second location in a busier, whatever it is. We ain't capitalized well enough to pay for all that stuff cash. We don't have the cash. So we got to go to the bank. But if we can't go to the bank because it's too expensive to go to the bank, that leaves us really high and dry. We can't grow. And that's what this gentleman just said. They are cutting back on their employment in other areas. I just told y'all that. The number one expense for most small businesses is employees. So if that small business is struggling, guess who the first, person, first, first thing they cut? You. And what is a small business? Under 500 employees, under $7 million in revenue. That's considered a small business in the United States. So if y'all working for any of those type of companies where they got less than 500 employees, less than 7 million in revenue, you better start looking for some multiple streams of income. I'm not saying you get fired. I'm just saying, what, 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 what's our motto? Prepare for the worst, expect the best. The worst is you get fired and you got no other income sources. That's the worst. You need to prepare for that, right? However, the labor market at large is a key reason the U.S. has thus far avoided a recession. But when you talk about the labor market, you, you, you also are talking about government, right? You're talking about government, jobs. When you look at the labor report that just came out in March, who had the most jobs added in March? Who are the two industries that had the most jobs added? Let's see if anybody's been paying attention. Who are the two industries? And when you look at the labor, the jobs report for March, who are the two industries that had the most jobs added? That's right, my guys just popped in. It's healthcare and the government. Oh, they said it was robust. No, uh -huh. listen, listen. What do we add? 300,000 jobs, 303? 303,000, something like that for the March uh, uh, jobs report. Guess what? Half of those jobs came from healthcare and government. Healthcare added 72,000, government added 71,000. You throw those two out, you got 150,000 jobs added in March. Hello. Hello. And guess what? I would, 
Well, and then you throw in 40,000 jobs was added by restaurants and, 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 and leisure. Leisure and hospitality added 42,000. So if you add them three together, you got 210,000 jobs up to 300,000. You only got 90,000 left for every other industry. And you think you're safe? You might be safe if you're a government employee. You might be safe if you're in healthcare. But if you ain't in those two industries, you better be getting you some secondary streams of income. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you, we've had more strength in employment than probably in commensurate with the state of business, Schilling said. During the labor shortage, businesses that were hiring had to compete for workers. Now those companies are reluctant to lay off staff after spending so much time and energy hiring new employees, which Schilling believes has kept the labor market stronger than expected. You haven't had that weakness in the labor market that I think you normally would have had and would have caused a recession in 2023, Schilling said. That doesn't mean we won't have one, but it means whatever it is, it's delayed. So they're thinking this whole labor market thing is short lived. At some point, people are going to start firing people. That's basically what he's saying. Companies now are kind of holding on to people because they're thinking, golly, it took us so much to get these people. We have put so much money into hiring them. Let's just hang on to them. But at some point, if interest rates stay higher for longer and these companies can't go out and borrow money to support that growth, at some point, they got to start letting these people go. That's why he said a recession is not off the table yet. It's not off the table yet. It's not off the table. That doesn't mean we won't have a recession, but it means whatever it is, it's delayed. However, Schiller is watching for signs of a slowing labor market, which we haven't gotten that yet. There are a lot of preliminary signs of weakness in the labor market, he said, pointing to wage gains, quits, and service inflation. It's the service inflation that really is a difficulty for the Fed. And if you look at wages in the service area, they're rising 5% or 6% a year over year, Schilling said. Now that's hardly commensurate with the Fed's target of 2%. There you go. The Federal Reserve has indicated that it plans to cut interest rates at least three times in 24. The Fed is going to reduce interest rates, but they want to make sure that inflation is killed and killed dead because I think the Fed is in no rush. And they and why should they be? Schilling said there's no clear evidence that the economy is falling apart. As long as the employment is as strong as it is, the Fed is in no rush to cut interest rates. But here's the kicker, guys. What if? The labor market does start to falter and fall off. What do you think is going to happen then to the economy? Because you've got to remember the three areas of money that comes into our economy is what? Loan money, people going out borrowing money, cheap money. That's, that's a form of supply of money. Wages, where people are working, earning a wage. And then you got assets or savings. You got assets or savings, wages, and you got cheap money from loans. Those are the three areas most people like you and I, that's where we get our money to live from. That's where we get our money to buy assets. That's where we get our money to just do whatever we do in this lifestyle. Right now, most of us only got one source of money, which is our wages. We don't have the ability to borrow money anymore, not at a cheap price. Now, if we're forced to go out like a gentleman in the live stream yesterday, said he was he, he, he was forced to go out and get a new car or get a car. 21% interest rate. Now, he didn't want to do that, but he had to. 21% interest rate for a car. See, that, that's, that's, that's what people are, most people are not willing to do. 21% is his interest rate. But he had to. 
Now, the good news for him, the car that he's paying the 21% interest rate on, he uses it for income. So, so it ain't a double whammy on him. That's, that might, might not be bad because all he has to do is generate enough money from the car to offset the expenses associated with the car and have some profit at the end of the day. He Gucci, he good, good to go. But how many of us out here have these 10 to 21 percent interest rates on cars and we don't produce no income with our car? All it does is take us from A to B. Those are the people who are they got to be panicking. Because I'm sure at that rate with the with, 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 with the payment on top of the insurance. On top of the gas. And y'all know the rule of thumb is, guys, we should not be spending no more than 10 percent of our take home pay on transportation. No more than 10 percent of our take home pay. We shouldn't be spending no more than 25 percent of our take home pay on rent or mortgage payment. If you pay more than that, you're at jeopardy of not building wealth for yourself. Just saying, guys, just saying, we're not out of the woods yet. No one wants a recession. But again, back what I told you guys earlier in the conversation, I don't, I'm going to build wealth anyways. Recession, no recession, doesn't matter to me. I'm building wealth because I'm in the market 365 days a year and I'm going to be in there for the next 10 years. No recession is going to last that long. I don't know any that lasted that long. Not, not in the modern era, maybe back in the, in the last Great Depression. But I'm talking about a recession, not a depression. 1929 was a depression. What is the difference? The difference between a depression and a recession is this. A recession is a temporary downturn in the economy. That's a recession. It's a temporary. A depression is a prolonged downturn in the economy. It's a difference. Once typically 12 months, 18 months maybe. The other one is much longer. It's prolonged. It's much longer. Like the depression of 1929. Those are your differences. So we're not talking about depression here where we have a prolonged downturn in the economy. We're talking about a recession, which is a temporary downturn in the economy. 2008 was the last great temporary downturn in the economy. But what did smart people do in 2008? If you go talk to anybody that's a self-made person that built wealth during that time, they will tell you that's why they built their wealth. Doing a recession is a great opportunity to build wealth, guys, because you're gobbling up these assets cheap. And then all you got to do is just hold them to the next, you know, period of prosperity. I buy them down here in the gutter and I hold them to the next period of prosperity. I make out like a fat rat. So even if a recession hit us, I'm okay with that. See, I'm prepared. I got cash reserves. I got a high income skill set that, that's not predicated on me selling people widgets. It's predicated on information. So I got a high income skill set. I got reserves. I got assets. So what do I do? I go to the reserves, I take the money out of the reserves, a part of it, and I just go, I go, I go shopping for the best assets I can find at the cheapest price. That's what I do in a recession. And guess what? I just wait 24 months until that period of prosperity starts again, just like it did in 2008. By the time 2010 rolled around, guys, we were in a period of increasing in prosperity. All of those properties that I bought in 2008, all of those stocks I bought in 2008 and 9 started going up. By the time 2019 rolled around, 2020 rolled around before the pandemic, we had experienced an incredible level of prosperity. From that 2008 all the way to 2019, we experienced a tremendous amount of prosperity. Think about all those assets I bought in 2008, and I just held them. Think, think what value they created for me. Not just real estate, but paper assets. Same thing would happen if a recession hit us this year or next year. I'll do the same thing. 
just buy them up. Now, if no recession hits and we just remain in this period of prosperity, that's okay. I'm still buying the asset at a lower price today than it will be later on in this period of prosperity. This is what a lot of us don't quite, we don't quite, it ain't, the light bulb ain't came on yet. You think because NVIDIA is trading at $900 a share, that's the highest it'll ever go. You're wrong. That is not the highest it'll ever go in my opinion. So me buying at 850, 900 a share, in my opinion, in today's market is a bargain compared to what it will be worth 10 years from now. And that's what a lot of us can't quite understand. We can't quite get our mind around that. But that's what you gotta trust the process. Whatever you're buying today, if it's a blue chip big boy, my opinion is 10 years from now, it'd be worth more. If you're sticking to blue chip big boys. Now, if you're going out here chasing some of these little bitty companies nobody ain't never heard of and you think you got a good tip from your buddy next door or some joke on YouTube, then okay. I can't guarantee you nothing on that. Can't guarantee you nothing on that. Let's talk a little bit about, let's talk about mortgage rates. Let's talk about mortgage rates for a little bit. We've talked about the Fed. We've talked about the recession. Again, guys, no one is saying the recession is going to unequivocally get here. I'm just telling you the, the pathway to a recession. The pathway to a recession is the labor market because that's the only form of, of money supply these people down here in the bust economy have. These people up here in the boom economy ain't worried about no recession because they got assets, they got reserves, and guess what they're going to do? Exactly what I just explained to you. If there is a recession, guess what they're going to do? They're going to get even richer because they're going to dig down in their reserves, pull money out, buy all these assets at a discount and just sit on them. That's what rich people do. That's what they did in 22. Remember 22 rolled around 2022? We had that bad year in the stock market. Guess what the rich people did who had cash reserves? Guess what they did? They dipped into those cash reserves, pulled them out, bought all these assets cheap on the cheap. They bought Meta, under $100 a share. They bought NVIDIA, about $150 a share. This was all in 22, guys. All in 22. Guess what happened at the tail end of 23? What happened to NVIDIA? What happened to Meta? NVIDIA nine times itself. Tesla five times itself. Not even two years, guys. Y'all are not quite understanding what I'm telling y'all. That's why you got to stick to big boy blue chip. I, I, I did a piece three or four days ago, a deep dive on NVIDIA. NVIDIA since 2000, I want to say 2016, eight years. It 12X'd itself in eight years. It went from five, mil, five billion in revenue in 2016, 5 billion in revenue to 60 billion. It 12X'd itself. They're predicting in the next eight years, it'll 12X itself again. Oh, you're putting all that money in the video in the price too high. Not if it 12X itself in the next 10 years, it ain't. It's a bargain today. This is what I'm trying to tell y'all. It's a bargain. See, I don't buy nothing that don't have historical proven track record of doing what it says it's going to do. It already 12X itself once. From 5 billion to 60 billion. If it 12X itself again, <whistles> even if it 10X, 8X, 7X, I'm going to make out like a fat rat. That's why I'm buying that's why I'm buying. That's why I'm telling you guys, hang your hat on proven companies. Hang your hat on proven ETFs. Not none of this funny stuff you ain't never heard of. Let's talk about rates. Let's talk about 30-year fixed rate mortgage rates because I know a few of y'all wanted me to cover that. So here we go. Here's the headline. Here's what forecasters predict mortgage rates will be through 2025. Here we go. To some of you guys out there that want to buy real estate for income, for some of you folks that want to buy real estate to just live in and it be a dead asset, here you go. 
Here we go. Let's talk about it. The economic forecasting has never been an easy task. And it becomes more challenging when confronted with unprecedented economic events like the pandemic, lockdowns, and unparalleled levels of government intervention followed by a rapid cycle of interest rate hikes. Look no further than recent mortgage rate forecasts. Last year marked the second year in a row mortgage rate forecasts at large have been missed big time. That raises the question, can we trust mortgage rate predictions at all right now? Probably not, but let's keep reading. The latest roundup of quarterly mortgage rate forecast shows that most forecasters still expect mortgage rates to gradually decrease over the next 18 months. One reason is that as the Federal Reserve presumably begins to cut rates, the bond market is expected to become less volatile, leading to a slight decline in mortgage rates. So here's the deal. The Fed funds rate, and again, guys, I'm an expert in my own opinion. You go out and do your own research and your own homework. I'm just trying to break this thing down to you because it was a lot of, you know what I'm saying? Let me break it down to you. So here's the thing. The Fed funds rate, which is AKA what they call short-term interest rates. Short-term interest rates is the Fed funds rate. What is the Fed funds rate? That's the rate banks borrow money from each other through the Federal Reserve. That's the way banks borrow money from each other based on the Fed funds rate. Now, that is not the rate you borrow money from banks. Typically, you borrow money from banks based on what they call the prime rate. So you got the Fed funds rate, banks borrow money from each other. Then you got the prime rate where the banks that borrow money from each other, they throw another level of interest rate on top of what they had to borrow the money for so that they can make profit. And that is 3%. So if I'm, at, if I'm borrowing money from the Fed at five and a quarter and I take that money, I lend it to you at eight and a quarter because I need to make money too. I'm making a 3% spread. That's called the prime rate. All right. So, and those are called variable rates. Why are they variable rates? Because they can go up and down. They're not fixed. The prime rate is not fixed. It goes up and down with whatever the Fed funds rate is. Or it can go up as high as the bank wants to charge you as long as they're not breaking any laws in the state that they're located in. So just because the prime rate is 8% doesn't mean the bank going to lend it to me at 8%. Most banks are going to say, we're going to give it to you prime plus one, prime plus two, prime plus three, prime plus 10. Normally with credit cards, it's like prime plus 10, prime plus 12, prime plus 13, and it's variable. So it can move every quarter. The prime rate can move once a quarter, right? So that's a variable interest rate. That's not what your mortgage rate is tied to. So your mortgage rate is a fixed rate in most cases, right? It's a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. What is it tied to? Well, it's not tied directly to the Fed funds rate. It's actually tied to the 10-year treasury bond rate. But the 10-year treasury bond rate is influenced by the Fed funds rate. As the Fed fund rate goes up, the 10-year treasury bond typically, what? what? What does it do? It typically goes up. Right. Because assets go down, those bonds go up. But the, the bond market, the secondary bond market competes with mortgage rates. Here's the thing, though, since they compete for the same investor. The secondary bond market is affected by the current bond market. Why? Because why would I go into the secondary bond market and get a get a get a 10 year treasury bond at a lower rate? then I can just go buy a brand new one with a better rate. So anytime new issues of treasury bond rates are higher, it affects the secondary bond market. Makes them less valuable. When they're less valuable, now they compete with mortgage rates. Mortgage rates typically do what? Go up because they're more valuable. So that's who they compete against. So 
short-term rates indirectly affect long-term rates is what these guys are saying. At some point when the Fed brings down short-term rates, the Fed funds rate, that will bring down the 10-year treasury bond rate in the, in the primary market. And in the secondary market tends to do what? Those rates go back up, right? When, when, when the primary bond market rates go down. So then the 30-year fixed rate mortgage rate goes down. Right. So 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 all I'm telling you is follow the Federal Reserve and the short term rate, because the short term rate is going to affect the bond market, which is the primary bond market. Right. So when rates come down, the primary bond market comes down, makes the secondary bond market a little bit more attractive. And then therefore, mortgage rates are less attractive because they compete with the bonds on the secondary market. Little confusing, but just trust the process. When them short-term rates come down, mortgage rates are going to come down as well at some point. So here we go. The average 30-year fixed rate as of Thursday was 6.99. That was last Thursday. By the final quarter of 2025, Fannie Mae expects that the slide to 6%. So they're thinking by the end, guys, of 2025, there will still be 6%. <laughs> that's still super high to me it is I've never had no 6% mortgage rate ever on any of my loans and I've been doing this for 25 years so to me it's high but they're expecting that by the end of 25 meanwhile Wells Fargo model expects 5.8 and the Mortgage Bankers Association 5.5 so you got a scale of 6% to 5.5 by the end of 25 I, I Okay. All forecasts with take all forecasts with a grain of salt. But if those forecasts come to fruition, it would mean that housing affordability would still remain strained <laughs> in 24 and 25. So yesterday, during the live stream, somebody asked me one of the questions was, well, you know, should I wait for mortgage rates to come down before I buy real estate? Or do I buy right now? And for me, it depends on what you're going to use the property for. If you're going to use the property to live in, you know, I, I personally, I probably wouldn't buy a house at 6%, six percent, six and a half percent rate. I wouldn't. Not if I'm just going to live in it. I'd rather just go rent a place. It's going to be cheaper. I ain't got no property taxes. I ain't got no insurance to pay. I ain't got no mortgage expense. I ain't got none of that. I just pay a flat fee and I can live in whatever neighborhood I want to live in and be, be good. I don't need to own it. Not if I just going to live in it. It's an unnecessary expense when I'm in the building stage of wealth. That's my opinion, guys. You guys do whatever you want to do. So I, I, I would say no. If I'm just going to live in a house right now, would I buy one right now? No. Not if I'm in the building stage of wealth because it's going to take up too much of my income to service that debt. One, I got high prices on houses and I got high interest rates. So it's gonna take a lot of my salary, a lot of my income to service that debt and to take care of them property insurance, take care of that property taxes, take care of repair and maintenance. I might wanna fix it up a little bit. I wanna beautify it a little bit. I might wanna do this. I might wanna do that. Before you know it, 50% of your paycheck going to, for a house that don't even create no income for you. That's my opinion. On the other hand, if I'm an investor and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm buying property, put tenants in it that generate income to pay for the property, I'm OK with buying right now. I'm OK with buying right now at 7 percent interest rate locked in for 30 years at the price levels today. Well, golly, why would you do that? Well, here's my thought process. When the Fed, indu when, when the Fed reduces interest rates at some point, what do you think going to happen to assets? We already talked about this. They're going up in value. Why are they going up in value? Because more money is coming into the marketplace now. More money is coming into the economy. And when people get more money into the economy through borrowing money and it's cheap, they take that money and they buy assets. So what does that increase? Demand. When demand increases, prices go up. Why? Because we already got a limited supply of inventory. You can't just generate a million homes in one year. 
We're like two million homes behind in inventory. Two million. You can generate that in one year. And, and guess what? No one's going to generate it anyways with interest rates at 7%. Why? You ain't got no demand to buy it. The hell I want to go out here and build a thousand houses for it and I can't sell them. <laughs> no one's going to do that. No national builder is going to do that. So for me, as an investor, that gives me the upper hand. Now I can go to a seller and say, listen, I know you done had this property on the market for 120 days, 180 days. I'm willing to take it off your hand, but you got to reduce the price for me and I'll take it off your hands. I've already done my research. I already know the offer that I'm giving him or her and they take it. I already know the, the rental income commensurate to that is enough to service the debt. I've already done my homework. I've done my cash flow analysis on the property already. So I know the rental income rate for that market is sufficient enough to cash flow. All I got to do is get him or her to sell me the house at that discount. Why would they do that? Seller fatigue. Had the property on the market for six months. They're ready to get rid of this thing. A lot of people kicking tires and rolling down windows, but ain't nobody buying. Why? People ain't buying because rates too high. So, so to make themselves feel better, what do they do? They go around rolling down windows and kicking tires. They ain't even to buy nothing. But that makes them feel better. Oh, honey, why don't we go look at some houses this weekend? Give us something to do and we can start planning. You ain't even to buy crap. Just wasting people's time. But if you go in there, real deal Holyfield, you the real deal Holyfield. You come in there with the pre-approval. Hey, go partner. Hey, partner. I got the pre-approval here, partner. You want to take this deal? I'm vetted, pre-approved, ready to rock and roll, partner. Or you can keep waiting on these people coming around here just to get them something to do on the weekends and kick tires and roll down windows. Or you can get this thing sold. He going to sell it. She going to sell it. Promise you. So for that type of investor, go get it. It's there. You got the upper hand. It's a buyer's market right now. Even though everybody thinks it's a seller's market, if you're vetted and you already got the pre-approval in hand and you're the real deal Holyfield, you got the upper hand. So for that type of buyer, go ahead and make your offers and go get you some good real estate. Over here, if you're just somebody that, oh, I, wanna, I want the white house and the picket fence and all this other stuff to go with the pool and I want a barbecue in the backyard, but you ain't at the enjoyment stage of wealth, I wouldn't buy nothing. I'd keep pouring my money in the assets, keep pouring my money in the paper assets. I keep pouring my money in the rental properties. And at some point in the future, when these rates really come down enough, then you'll be in a position to go ahead. Once you've built wealth, then go get the dream home. So that's my position on, on real estate, guys. You take it for what it's worth. I'm just giving you my little two cents. The housing market is likely to continue to face the dual affordability constraints of high home prices and elevated interest rates in 24. Just told you that. I just gave it to you in, in, in regular terms. I, I already told you. That it's going to continue to be that way. And you think it's high now? You think home prices are high right now? Whoo! You wait till they reduce some interest rates. And that demand floods back in. That pent up demand and all these people out here want, that's trumping the bit and ready to buy. But they can't because they can't afford it with the rates. Woo, them rates job in a couple years, guys, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. So for me, if I'm a real estate guy, real estate investor, real estate gal, boom, I'm buying right now. I can always refinance my loan down the road, but I won't get the same price. I won't get the same price two years from now that I can get today. That's what I believe. You can believe whatever you want, but that's what I believe. Interest rates in 24. Doug Duncan, chief economist of Fannie Mae in March, Hotter than expected inflation data and strong payroll numbers are likely to apply more upward pressure to mortgage rates this year than we've previously forecasted. As markets continue to evolve, their expectations of future monetary policy still, while we don't expect a dramatic surge in the supply of homes for sale, we do anticipate an increased level of market transactions in 23, even if mortgage rates remain elevated. I don't know about that. Some of you mortgage folks out there, some of you real estate agents out there, how many homes are you selling? I don't know. Go ask your local real estate agents how many houses are they selling right now. I know down here in Southwest Florida, one of the hottest markets in the country, Naples, Florida, it didn't slow down. 
That's one of the hottest markets in the country, Naples, Florida, man. They didn't slow down. Turtle pace. I don't know. I don't know. All I'm telling you is you got property out there on the market for sale. Now is the time, in my opinion, to go. If you're, if you're the real deal Holyfield and you're, and you're ready to go, you're bankable. You got your pre-approval. You got your down payment money. Whew. May not be a better time to go right now to go cut you some deals, man. Some really good deals. I know people have done that and they've gotten some good deals. They've gotten 10% off ass, 15% off ass. Because they went in with the real deal Holyfield and they were real buyers, not these people running around on the weekends and wasting people's time, kicking tires and rolling down windows and ain't finna buy nothing. That's a waste of your time. They want somebody really coming in there vetted and ready to make a deal. If you're that guy or that gal, go get you some real estate. Don't worry about the rate. You can always refinance the rate. I'd rather go get me a 10 or 15 percent discount today on the price and just refinance the rate when it's time. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. Last thing we're going to do and we're going to get out of here because I told y'all I got to give you your daily, daily dose, your daily dose of crypto. But before I do that, one quick thing, get down to that description box, click on that Moomoo link, get them seven free stocks. When you put $100 in there, guys, I know some of y'all just checking in. Get down to the description box. Click on that Moomoo link. Get them seven free stocks. Well, Richard, what stocks are they going to be? Magnificent seven. They're going to give you fractional share stocks of the Magnificent seven. Tesla. NVIDIA. Amazon. Alphabet. Meta. Microsoft. Apple, the Magnificent Seven, you're going to get fractional shares of the Magnificent Seven when you open a new Moo Moo brokerage account. You put $100 in there. They're going to give you the Magnificent Seven. Then here's what you do. You put your thousand bucks in there and you say, well, OK, Richard, I like the Magnificent Seven. I like SPLG. I like FTEC. Guess what? Now you can buy fractional shares. But you got to have money in the account. You can't have three bucks in there and be like, I don't see fractional share trading yet. Why would they give it to you? You got three bucks in your account. No matter, no matter though, they ain't gonna pay no attention to you with $3 in there. You gotta put some money in there. Put your 200, 300, 400, 500 dollars in there and then if you want, buy SPLG, buy FTEC and buy you some fractional shares of the Magnificent Seven. If you've always wanted to buy Tesla, if you've always wanted to buy Microsoft, if you've always wanted to buy NVIDIA but you couldn't afford it, now you can. Get down to that description box. Click on that Moomoo link. Open up that Moomoo account today. Put some money in it. Get the Magnificent Seven. Fractional shares. Limited time offer, guys. Don't delay. Act today. Put yourself in the game. Get off the sideline. Get in the game. It's okay. Get in the game. We'll let you play. You just need to know the rules. I'm here on this channel teaching you the rules so you can get in the game. You get in the game. You know the rules. The rules are what? Open your brokerage account. Put your money in the brokerage account and get to execute. Oh, I don't know how to use the app. Send me an email. I'll send you a video showing you how to use the app. Now, I got to update the video a little bit because I got to also go back and do a new one so I can show you fractional shares, but that's okay. For now, just go ahead and get the app set up. You'll be good to go. Get your seven free stocks. You Put your money in there. Fractional share button will pop up. It'll be there. And then at some point, I'm going to get around to updating the video. But for now, you don't need all that. It's easy to figure out. Just get the video I got right now and you'll figure it out. It's pretty simple. And then I'll do an update video down the road sometime. Also, I'll send you my wealth transfer blueprint, which is the three big boy paper assets I'm buying in 24 and beyond a triple, double my net worth. I'd love to triple it, but at least double it. If you want to copy my plan, see what I'm doing, rock with me, send me an email and I'll go ahead and send you that. All right, let's go ahead and get you your daily dose of crypto. We'll get you all out of here. Here's the headline. Some of you guys are going to love this. Here's the headline. Bitcoin may rally to 80K on triangle break technical analysis i don't know what any of that means but let's find out together let's find out together it, it sounds good i don't know what any of it means but it sounds good 
I know what the 80K mean, but all that triple triangle offense, all that, I don't know what that means. But let's read, let's figure it out together. Bitcoin, the leading cryptocurrency by market value, could soon rally to new record highs after breaking through a so-called triangle resistance. All that really is, guys, in my opinion, is, is, you know, the market, the market will either accept or reject a price for something, right? Accept or reject. And lately, the market has been rejecting Bitcoin at 72, 73,000 a coin. They've been rejecting it. Now they're saying they've had a breakthrough and this whole triangle resistance, according to technical analysts by 10X Research. Early Monday, Bitcoin rose past 72,000, passing through a triangular consolidation pattern identified by a resistance line connect, connecting March 15. All that means is nobody wasn't willing to pay more than 73 for it. That's all that means. All this fancy talk, it just nobody was willing to pay more than that for it. Now, they believe people will be willing to pay it because now it's broken through some kind of way. I don't know how that happened, but well, let's keep reading. If the breakout is bullish, which we expect, Bitcoin could climb above 80,000 during the next few weeks, if not earlier. Buying at 69,280 and setting a stop loss at 65 appears appropriate. I don't know what any of that means. Some of you guys out there might know what that means. I don't know what that means. I ain't gonna be doing that, but you, if you want to, you can. I don't know what all that is. I don't want to know. I don't care what a stop loss is. Now, if you want to go look it up on the, the one trillion dollar research lab, you go right ahead. It ain't my cup of tea, but I'm gonna keep reading. The upside target of 80,000 equates to at least a 10% rise from the current price of 72. So basically they're saying if you buy it at 72,000 right now, there's a possibility in a couple weeks you could be at 80,000. I don't know. Now, if something crashes, if something bad news come out, if this Wednesday inflation report come out bad, I don't know about that 80,000. So uh, it's a gamble. The breakout comes on the heels of a hotter than expected non-farm payrolls report. See, there you go. That's the catalyst, right? What was the catalyst? The catalyst was you came out with a jobs report, right? That was the catalyst. Okay, spurring risk taking across all corners of the financial market. Bitcoin has been riding what can be described as an everything rally this year. <laughs> Not only has the cryptocurrency soared to new highs, but so have traditional assets like Wall Street, tech heavy index, NASDAQ, the broader S&P and gold. The cryptocurrency's rally has been supported by persistent expansion in the supply of major stable coins. In technical, in technical analysis, investors and analysts study price per, per patterns to predict future trends in the asset. A symmetrical triangle, often called a coil. I don't know what all that is, and I ain't going to read any more of that because now it's just all this crazy stuff. All it is is a pump and dump. And if there's enough people willing to pump, then you make money. When the pump stops and people won't pay that price for it anymore, then you don't make money. So it's up to you. Like I said, it's your, it's your daily dose. Bitcoin is on a run. The stock market's on a run. They are intertwined. Both of them move on the same type of catalyst. And the last catalyst was what? The jobs report. The next catalyst will be tomorrow, which is uh, um, Wednesday, which is the, the labor, I mean, which is the CPI inflation report for March. If that comes in and it beats expectations and inflation is going down, guess what you're going to see happen in the stock market? Guess what you're going to see happen in Bitcoin? It's going to go up. Why? Renewed enthusiasm. Renewed enthusiasm. That's all that is, is enthusiasm. That's FOMO. Oh, golly, we got a great CPI report. The Fed has to reduce interest rates now. Inflation is down to 2.8%. See, that's FOMO. That's going to drive Bitcoin up. It's going to drive the stock market up because that fear of missing out. Just telling you, that's my opinion. Appreciate y'all, man. We're going to wrap this thing up for today. Hopefully, we got some good information to you. 
that will help you build wealth and get to your financial freedom. Hopefully you guys will take some of these tidbits, these nuggets, these breadcrumbs and, and do something with them today. Hopefully you're in the market 365 days a year. Hopefully you're in it long term. Hopefully you got your mindset right. Hopefully you've reprogrammed the filter system to be more patient, to be more consistent, to be more disciplined. Hopefully you're starting to think about developing multiple streams of income to protect yourself in the event something catastrophic happens like a recession, a temporary downturn in our economy. Hopefully you got multiple streams of income to protect yourself from that. Hopefully you got a long-term plan to buy assets and be in the market every day with money that's multiplying and growing, right? Hopefully you're living on less than what you make. Hopefully you're living on a plan, which is a personal budget. Hopefully you're keeping yourself out of consumer debt and saving and investing. Emergency fund, stock market, real estate, businesses. Hopefully, hopefully you're doing some of these things, guys. That's the whole point of this channel. So lock it in with a thumbs up before you get out of here. I appreciate y'all for rocking with me today. Y'all have been great. We just started off the week, red hot, coming out to shoot. Every day I'll be here at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time to deliver some information to you that hopefully can help you guys build wealth and get to your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. That's the whole key, right? So lock it in with a thumbs up if you're rocking with me on that. Also, don't forget, guys, get down to the description box. Click on that Instagram link. Follow me on Instagram, Richard Fame Millionaire Mentor. Be aware there are many, many, many scammers on Instagram. So my recommendation, if you're going to follow me, get down to the description box and click on that actual link. It'll take you directly to where you need to go. If you go on Instagram and type in Richard Fame Millionaire Mentor, three or four of them might come up and you, you're going to get confused. You ain't going to know who, who the real one is. All you got to really know to know it's me is, is when you go over and you look at the profile and it says followers, you'll see one number. And then when it says following, that's me following somebody, it'll be zero. And I only got like 23, um, 23, 23 posts. So 23 posts, like 1,500 followers and zero following. That's how you know it's me. But to really know it's me, go down to the description box and click on that link. Uh, and you'll, you'll go directly to me. Also, don't forget, launch day, Richard Fame Millionaire website will be Friday, hopefully, this week. That's the launch day. And I'm really excited about it. So be on the lookout for that. Also, like I said, if you want the Magnificent Seven fractional share stocks, all big boys, all blue chip, three of the top value companies in the world, you'll be getting free fractional shares of. That be Microsoft, that be uh, Apple, and that be NVIDIA. Those are three of the top, top, these are the three top country, com companies in the world, market value-wise. You're going to get them as fractional shares for free for opening your Moomoo account. Put $100 in there, you're going to get fractional shares of the Magnificent Seven. How are you going to beat that? Right? Now, get down to the description box and click on that link if you want that offer. Well, guys, thank you, man. Like I said, lock it in with a thumbs up before you get out of here. I appreciate you. Have a great rest of your Monday. Do something productive. Get one step closer to building wealth, right? Tell yourself that you love yourself. Tell yourself that you believe in yourself. And it'll happen, right? It'll happen. But you got to tell yourself these things. Can't look for others to tell you. You tell yourself. That's what's most important. That's what's most important. If you're stopping by the channel for the first time, please consider subscribing, share the video, smash the like button. Thoughts become things. You can see it in your mind. You can hold it in your hands. You guys keep chasing your greatness. Never stop believing in yourself. Stay healthy, get wealthy, and we'll catch you on the next one. Peace.